Now, uh, this is the last lecture that is going to deal with React. Um, but of course, as with any other module, I guess uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we know all about React. There's lots and lots of stuff that I just don't have an opportunity to cover with you. Uh, but maybe you might uh, include some stuff in the assignment that um, reflects your reading around this topic. So we look at one more aspect of uh, developing a, a single page app. It's a more generic topic this time, actually, even though there's a practical aspect to it very much so a practical aspect to it. But it's something that we could apply, no matter what single page app framework we were using. And I will also give you a briefing on assignment one today as well. So the last topic that I want to cover uh, in relation to uh, single page apps is, well, I, I've titled it data fetching and caching. I could equally have titled it state management. Uh, but there's one aspect of it. It's not so much state management that I want to focus in on. It's this area of caching. That's going to be the main focus of this uh, first half of the lecture. And we're going to be using a third party library called React Query uh, as well as the central piece of implementing caching. And then I'll talk about the assignment. So to, to step back for a moment from the detail of caching, uh, I want to just talk about state or data in relation to single page apps. And it turns out there are two aspects to any single page app's data and the data that it needs to manage. There is client state data and server state data. So we're told on this slide that uh, client state data is often referred to as app state as well. It's something that is private to each instance of a client. And examples of it, you know, might make it a little bit clearer. So if we talk about the movies app that we're developing in the lab and we have the filtering card where you can select the genre and enter some text into the um, into the search box, anything that's entered on that little form, that's obviously private to each instance, each running instance of our single page app client, because one user might have selected one thing on the genre list, another user would have selected something else. We have to store which one they've selected somewhere, uh, but we characterize that type of data as client state data. Other examples uh, would be, well, maybe if, if the single page app allowed the user to somehow theme their UI. Simple example might be uh, dark mode, light mode. There might be a switch that the user can click to change the UI from dark mode to light mode. It's not a difficult thing to do in relation to React, as it turns out. Um, but uh, that would be another example of client state data. The current logged in user, maybe the user's ID or their token, that has to be stored somewhere on the browser in the browser, but it's characterized as client state data as well. So what's common about all of these examples? Number one, I'm saying that the client owns it. It's private to the client and it's not shared with any other instance of the client that might be running. It's not persisted anywhere, uh, not uh, across Sessions anyway, you, you know, you might store it, you could store it in session management and session storage within the browser or indeed in the browser's local storage, but you would tend to clean it out once the app had shut down within the browser. You don't persist it across user sessions. That's the kind of point I'm trying to make. Uh, this idea that it's always up to date, well, I guess it's obvious that it is always up to date uh, within within each client. It's accessed synchronously because it's local to your React app. And we know now that uh, we, in the case of a React single page app, 
the use state hook is what we would use to store our client state uh, within the React code base. Uh, again, I just want to check that people can hear me, please. Yep, I can hear you anyway. Great. Yeah. Um, down here, then I'm talking about in how do we manage uh, client state because that, that could be quite a lot of client state. Uh, so we need to put some thought into how we manage it. Um, one way is each component could manage a piece of your client state, especially if that data is not shared with other components. Or as we saw last week, we could put client state that's shared by multiple components. We could put that into a context construct in relation to React anyway. That's all fairly familiar to us. That's all client state. Now, it's not really client state that we're interested in today, though. The other aspect of a single page app's state or data is what we characterize as server state, which is data that we retrieve from our backend, but we do have to store it temporarily within the browser. And in relation to this model view controller pattern that I would have mentioned way, way back, this would now is, is where the M comes into play in relation to uh, a single page app or in relation to a React app. So examples, uh, again, that we will be familiar with, the list of movies that we download from TMDB, that would be an example of server state, the details about a particular movie, another example, the list of friends in our friends app, they're all examples of server state data. And some of its characteristics are obviously different to the characteristics of client state data. Number one, uh, it is persisted remotely. It has to be persisted at the back end because it is shared by multiple instances of our client. Uh, it's accessed asynchronously because it's uh, over a network. Uh, I'm saying here it can change without the client uh, necessarily knowing it. Um, so if one user, let's supposing we had the ability to make changes to a movie's details. Okay, let's just imagine that. So one user might make a change to a particular movie's details and persist it back in the server side. But unless another instance of our client has explicitly kind of refreshed their page, if they happen to be looking at the same movie, unless they explicitly refresh it or manually refresh it, then they won't, they won't be aware that a change has been made to the movie data. So that's obviously an issue. So potentially, I'm saying the client can be looking at out-of-date data. And there are ways to overcome this, but again, that's not what we're necessarily looking at today. And we'd use, in relation to React, we'd use the use state and use effect hooks to uh, acquire and store uh, server state data. It's debatable whether we should really be using use state. Uh, maybe we should be using some sort of third party library to take care of storing server state data within the browser. For example, you may have come across references to something called Redux, which is a third party library. There are lots and lots of third party libraries that handle state management, server state management for single page apps. Uh, lots of them out there. Um, we are not using any of them. We are using the use state hook to take care of storing our server state as well as our client state. But you could argue that we should really refactor that out separately. But we kind of ignore the fact that we're not doing that. Uh, in terms of managing server state data, there's a couple of options I'm saying. Number one, um, we could store server state within a particular component uh, using the use state hook. That would certainly make sense if that's if a particular part of the server state was only used by one component. So there's no point in making it global. So that would work fine. Um, and it would be what I'm calling a good separation of concerns, you know, because it's only the component that needs to know that server state data. Uh, it manages it, manages that data, and no other component needs to worry about it. 
The downside of taking that approach is this one here, though. Essentially, every time that particular component is remounted, then it's going to refetch the same data from the back end over and over again. Now, that's not a problem if the nature of that data is such that it is changing very, very frequently. But if it's not changing frequently, then those that those um, um, uh, subsequent kind of fetches that are made by the component to the server side are unnecessary. And we'd like to avoid that. And obviously, every time it, uh, that component remounts, then you know, there's a double re-rendering re of that component going on. So the user doesn't see the most up, doesn't see the data immediately. It has to wait until the data arrives back from the server side and the component re-renders. So that's kind of poor from a user experience uh, perspective. Alternatively, we, if the nature of the server state data is such that it's used by multiple components, then we could store it in a context. Uh, and that's, that would work okay. Uh, and the, the advantage of storing in the context, because you, you might remember from last week, the context provider component is very high in the component hierarchy. And typically, it's only mounted once and it's never unmounted again, as long as the uh, React app is running in the browser. So there's no unnecessary refetching of the data going on for the, if we store it in in a context. Uh, the downside of it, though, is potentially, you know, so you might conclude, well, why don't we store all server state data in a context and then we don't uh, do unnecessary refetching when it's not necessary. The downside of it is, though, that you are then potentially delaying the initial load time of your app uh, while it's waiting for lots of data to come back from the back end. Um, and also, you've got a poor separation of concerns because you're just essentially lumping all of your server data into one construct, and that's not great. Uh, the third option isn't really an improvement. The third option is what I was referencing there a moment ago. We could use a third-party library like Redux to take care of fetching the data, storing it, and providing it to our React code. But the React code, the, the kind of re-rendering issue still applies, though, um, you, if you are using a third-party library. Uh, so it's really, I'm saying, the same as option two above. And as always, when you've got options, then the best solution is some sort of uh, mixture of the different options that you have, if that's possible. So I'm saying here that we want we want the best of one, which is good separation of concerns um, without the downside of one, which is refetching. And we want the best of two, which is no refetching without the downside, which is poor separation of concerns. So it's a kind of a difficult one to juggle. So anyway, that's a server state, and this is the focus of this lecture, really. Client state, we've kind of taken care of up to now. How do we uh, essentially avoid this kind of unnecessary refetching of server state data every time a component remounts? Because we know the components will remount multiple times if you've got multiple pages that make up your app. So we have a simple little app to demonstrate this. Uh, and the app just consists of two pages. Uh, one page, again, it's using my movies TMDB. One page is giving, displaying a list of movies. And it, these are uh, hyperlinked. And if we click on one of them, then we go to a page which shows us some details on the movie. I'm just outputting the JSON uh, here now because we're not really interested in UI at this stage. What we're really interested in is the data itself and managing the server state data. Uh, you'll get this app, uh, if I go back to the website. Uh, you'll get it in this archive, download it, unzip it, import it, and uh, bring it into your VS Code. Uh, so that's the app. And there are two pages, and I'm saying that both page, both pages make a HTTP request to TMDB, which would kind of uh, 
we have a sense of that. Now, the problem is um, if we examine, sorry now, um, if we examine what's happening at the network level as we navigate around this application, then what we see is something like this. And what I'm trying to get across here, and I'll demonstrate it now in a second to you. Uh, let's supposing we start at the home page, and my React app makes a request to TMDB to get 20 movies from the discovery endpoint. Then let's say we navigate to the first movie on that list. So it displays the movie details page. And that movie details page causes my app to make rightly to make a request to TMDB to get the details of that movie and displays it. Then if we navigate back to the home page, here we go again. The app is going to re-request the 20 movies from TMDB. And let's suppose we navigate to the same detail page again. It's going to make the same request to TMDB for the details on that movie. So clearly, uh, bar the first two requests, uh, the rest, some of the rest are unnecessary. And we can just see that happening live. So if I bring in the code into my VS code. So this is the archive that I've unzipped from the website. And in terms of the code, there's my two pages, my home page and my movie details page. And the components, uh, which we're not really interested in, but again, they're kind of familiar. We go to movies component which displays the movie on the movies detail page and we've got this filter movies because I can do filtering as well although we're not interested in filtering uh, functionality today so it's really these two components which represent our pages and if we look at the move the home page you know um, here we're storing just the text the contents of the text box the filtering text box here we're storing the set of movies returned by TMDB and we're making our, our HTTP call inside a use effect hook. So all of that is fairly familiar. And in the movies detail page, similar kind of stuff. Uh, we're storing the movie in the state variable. We have our use effect hook. Um, yeah, so if we just run it, I guess. So I've already done my install. Just ignore that, ignore that for now. Open up my developer tools. Uh, make sure you access the network tab, which is in my case is this one here. Also, if you select, uh, let's see. Yeah, you see you have different options here. Uh, well, I'm not really interested in the request that my React app makes for JavaScript code, which it does initially, obviously, it requests the JavaScript code and maybe any CSS code uh, from the from the development server. But I'm not really interested in seeing those HTTP requests. You might be interested in them in, in, in a different uh, scenario, but not, not, not today. What we're interested in is this one here, any fetch requests. So make sure you select that because otherwise, if, like if I select all, for example, and I just do a manual refresh, you know, there's lots of stuff being sent down, mainly JavaScript code that's being sent down to my browser from the development server that comes with the Vite tool. But I'm not interested in any of that stuff, as I said. So I'm just going to select this one here, fetch. Uh, uh, XXR, and now we can just see the fetch requests made by my app. So again, I'll just do a manual refresh again. Okay, and that's the HTTP request for 20 movies. I select the first movie, 
Here's the request for that movie's details. That's all fine. If I go back to the home page, it's fetching the 20 movies again, unnecessary. If I select the same first movie on the list, it's making the HTTP request all over again. Uh, so can we avoid those unnecessary refetches? And you can see that they're all full requests. You know, they're all status 200. They're not any of the status 300s that you might get where the backend tells the browser uh, the data hasn't changed since you requested last. I don't need to send it to you again. So we don't get that benefit really. So that's the problem. Um, and I'm just explaining the problem there. Now the solution is our A solution is to use caching. And what is caching? Caching is where you store temporarily the API data, your server state data, store it locally in the browser, which makes sense. Um, and the benefit of caching is it reduces the workload uh, both on the browser, but it also reduces the workload on the back end because the back end is not receiving as many requests. So you can imagine if you had hundreds of thousands of users using your React app, and we didn't uh, we didn't employ caching here now in our solution, which we've yet to see, then there's there are just way too many requests hitting our back end as a result. So that's a, a, an extra benefit on the back end. And it speeds up, I'm saying, the re-rendering time uh, when we re revisit pages. So because what caching will mean now is that we no longer need to make the uh, unnecessary requests to the backend. We already have the data locally in the browser. And so we're accessing it synchronously uh, from here on in. Here, I'm just describing how caching kind of works. So I've got my React code, my single page app code. I've got my cache functionality. Note now that the cache functionality and your SPA code are all resident in the browser. I probably should have made that clear from this picture, but they are um, co-located. So any communication between these two uh, is synchronous. And then I've got my backend or my API. So the way caching works is, uh, your your uh, your React code, first of all, it asks the cache, do you have a particular piece of data? And it specifies the data by using a key. And we'll see in a second how we uh, uh, can decide on the keys. So it says, essentially, do you have a particular piece of data? Here's the key of the data that I'm interested in. And if the cache doesn't have it in its data store, then it sends the request for that data to the backend, backend eventually responds, stores it locally, and then gives the data to your React app and it renders it. Subsequently, when the app, React app asks the cache for the same data by specifying the same key, the cache will now realize I have that data, I don't need to go to the backend and it'll just uh, provide it immediately. Simple as that really. So what are caches? I'm saying caches are in-memory data stores. Uh, okay, they have high performance because essentially they're local to the client or to whoever is uh, making the request to them. But they are essentially just in-memory data stores. Um, I'm saying that from a structural point of view, they're just key-valued stores. So it's a bit like a map structure, if you like, um, but a little bit more sophisticated than that. Uh, the keys have to be unique. The values can be anything you want them to be in, in general, as long as it's serializable. So the value could be a primitive, an array, an object, an array of objects, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that's serializable can be a value associated with one key. We have this notion, this is just kind of caching terminology now. And if you've come across caching before, then you will be familiar with this terminology. We have the notion of a cache hit and a cache miss. This is just terms that we use. So if I go back to the previous screen, what we would say is that a cache miss occurred here. Cache miss means that when the 
client asked the cache for a particular piece of data, that data was not present in the cache. We refer to that as a cache miss. Whereas when a client asks the cache for a piece of data and it already has it, then we refer to that as an occurrence of a cache hit. Um, I'm saying caches have a very simple interface. Essentially, there's only a, a, a tiny set of operations that any client would want to carry out uh, with a cache. Uh, uh, there's the kind of cache, this is in very generic terms now, there's the kind of cache get request that a client might make where it specifies the key of the data that it's looking for and it returns, the cache returns the serialized value associated with that key if it has it. Of course, if it doesn't, then we know what happens. It makes the request to the uh, ultimate backend and when eventually that data arrives, it will then return the serialized value. So this request here could be synchronous or asynchronous depending on where the data is. Uh, sometimes the client may actually want the cache to delete an entry from its data store. So you tend to have a delete operation. A purge operation is where the client can actually get the cache to um, purge all of its data. Because caches could actually build up over time. And um, because they're in memory data stores, we don't want them to grow too big because then they've become slightly unperformant. Uh, next, I'm saying that cache entries uh, have a time to live. When you're configuring your cache uh, in general, you would specify a time to live for each entry in the cache, not on an item by item basis, but kind of globally. And choosing an appropriate time to live can impact on the overall performance of your cache because you don't want data, not so much, well, performance and also the potential staleness of the data in the cache. Uh, you know, if, if the data, if the nature of the data of the server side data is such that it is changing frequently, then you would set a low time to live potentially. And what low is now really depends on the nature of the data, but you would set a low time to live so that the cache, see, that, sorry, the time to live is what the cache uses itself to determine whether when it should remove entries from its data store. Up here, I'm talking about the client explicitly telling the cache to delete an entry from the data store, but the cache also needs to self-manage the data store. And that self-management is controlled by whatever you choose to be the time to live attribute uh, that you want to associate with uh, all of your cache entries. And the cache takes care then of removing entries from its data store once an entry's TTL uh, expires. It, takes, it does that for you. So these are just general uh, aspects of caching that I mentioned here, again, kind of for completeness sake, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of choosing TTL times, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So to come back to our React app and our, our problem, a little app that I demonstrated there a moment ago, uh, there is a third party library called React Query, although when I looked it up today, just online, it seems to have rebranded itself, but originally it was called React Query. And the rebranding, I think, has occurred really because of the popularity of this third party library. So what it is, uh, what React Query is, I'm saying is a third party JavaScript. Okay, originally it was written for React apps, but it can be used with different single page app frameworks. Uh, so Angular, Solid, Svelte, all of them use this third, can potentially use this uh, uh, third party library. I guess that's why they rebranded it. It's no longer called React Query. It's now called TAN Stack Query or something like that. Uh, it's TAN is the is a reference to the person that developed it. Um, and what's nice about it is that it provides hooks, right? So that's a, an indication that it was written originally 
for our use with React apps. So that's the way we actually interface with this React query library is through the medium of hooks. And so here's the main hook that you would use, the use query hook. This is essentially uh, the way you would implement a get operation uh, against the cache. And in the use query hook, you specify the key of the data that you're looking for. And you also specify what's called the query function. And the query function is something that you write because React Query obviously doesn't know anything about the nature of the web API that your React app is using. For example, it doesn't know anything about TMDB. So you've got to provide React Query with a function that encodes how it should communicate with the back end. So we've got to write that function and uh, give it to the React Query library. So when you use the use query hook, specifying a key, and you also give it a reference to the query function, if it already has the data in the cache, then it simply returns it. If it doesn't, it, it uh, invokes this function, which takes care of communicating with the back end. When the response comes back from the back end, it then takes the response and puts it into the cache and then returns back the data to you. Now, what it actually returns is something a little bit more elaborate than that. And I'm showing you here that it returns this uh, object structure, really, and a number of parts to it. The data key within this object structure will refer to the, the data associated with the key. And now, initially, let's suppose the, there's a cache miss, which means uh, it has to invoke this function first. Uh, to get the data. So the use query hook, when it, when it responds, and it, it will respond synchronously, but when it responds the first time, data will essentially be pointing at null, error. Well, no error has occurred so far, so that will also be null. Is loading, is a Boolean, that's actually going to be true, because this loading means that it's waiting for the data to arrive back from the back end. Uh, is error will also be false. So the use query hook will respond that way initially. Eventually, when the data does arrive back and it puts it into the data store, now it kind of essentially updates this structure. Data now will be pointing at the actual data in the data store, in the, in the cache. Error hopefully will be pointing at null, assuming no error has occurred. Error is dictated by the HTTP response status. Is loading will be false because it has now loaded it into the cache. Is error will be false. So we use these values here within our React code to try and determine, do we have the data already or not? If we don't have the data, then maybe display something on the page indicating that we're waiting for the data to arrive. Uh, if we do have the data, then render it on the page. If there's an error, then, well, it's up to us to decide what we want to do. When an error occurs, we might display something to the screen or go back to some default page using programmatic navigation. It's really up to us. So that's the main interface that we use with this uh, React query library, the use query hook. And as I said, it's essentially, it's a get operation against the cache. Uh, the use query hook I'm saying down here, it does cause a component to re-render. If you take that scenario where a cache miss occurs, then clearly our component needs to re-render once the data has been returned from the web API. But we don't want to freeze up our UI. And so initially, you know, is loading is going to be true and we display something temporarily, temporarily on the screen. And the very last, I'm saying that essentially the use query hook means that we can now get rid of our own use state and use effect invocations in our code. They essentially replace them. And if we looked inside the detail of use query, we'd probably find that it, it uses use state and use query. Well, maybe not use state, but it certainly may use use query, use effect, sorry. It uses use effect internally. Uh, so, okay, before I go on to the next, so what that means is if I go back to my code and I've provided a readme and the readme explains how you can change the code 
so that it's now using the cache. So let's just do that. If we look at the home page first, and if we open up the README, and essentially tells you, go into the home page, which is saying here, right? Go into your home page and replace this code that's currently in there and replace it with this code. So let's just do that. So I'm going to comment out this because it's no longer required. And if we just glance at the code, so here I'm using the use query hook. I've just decided arbitrarily the key that I'm going to use is discover. Okay, that's kind of reflecting the name of the web the the TMDB endpoint that I'm using. But I could have used any string that I want to. And I'm also providing a query function. And this query function, you know, we, we've already seen the code from that or something very similar to it before. But if we just take a quick glance at it, uh, where do I have it here? You know, there's my query function. So there's no real surprise there. And so, that has now been saved. So if I go back to my running app and I'll go back to the home page, and I'm going to do a manual refresh to make sure we're testing like would like. So it's made a call for the 20 movies from TMDB as we'd expect. Let's select the first movie. It's made the deep call for that movie's details. Now, if we go back to the home page, it hasn't made a subsequent request to TMDB. So mission accomplished. It has actually got the list of movies this time from my uh, React query cache. Go into the say, go to the same movie, still making the request for the movie details. But every time I go back to the home page, it's not requesting, it's not re-requesting that data. So that means, you know, I got a cache miss when this occurred, but for every subsequent time I revisited the home page, I got a cache hit. And, you know, if we in terms of the code, so the first time this the first time this component uh rendered, which was at mount time, then you know the use query, as I said, was a cache miss. And you can see here, I'm just checking to see, is loading true? So when the cache miss occurred, is loading would actually be true. And so even though we don't see it because it's happening so quickly, my app does temporarily render this up onto the screen. Eventually, uh, and as well, the React query is going to execute my query function. The data comes back. And eventually then uh, data is now going to be pointing at the list of 20 movies. This component is going to re-render because the use query uh, causes the re-rendering to happen, just like a state change would cause a re-rendering to happen. When the re-rendering happens, is loading is now false, so it skips over that. Uh, is error is also false, it skips over that. I grab the movies from well, what it returns data here is what the React query returns. And that's essentially the full uh, HTTP response that came back. And we know we have to index into the results property of that HTTP response to get the actual movies. And then I render the movies. Okay. Sorry, dear Miss mm -hmm. uh, Christian. 
on the cache there, you've got discover is the key for it. Um, will it change? How does it know that the data isn't stale in the cache? Or if you change discover to something else, will it? How, how does that work? Uh, well, there's two questions there. Uh, the staleness is controlled essentially by me. I set a time to live. Now, of course, what I haven't shown you is if we go into index.jsx, um, here is where I first of all instantiate the, uh, the query cache kind of runtime within my browser. And, cool. you know, a lot of it is, is boilerplate stuff. But for example, I do here, I'm kind of, uh, let's see here, sorry. Here is where I'm setting my uh, TTL. And I think I've set it to something like an hour, right? Because I know the nature of my data is such that it's not going to change over an hour long period. In fact, over a day period. So, so that's the answer to the question. How how does the React query know whether the data is stale or not? Because simply because this hasn't expired. And the second part of your question, remind me what the second part of the question was. Sorry. So it's reliant on the key discover being in cache. Oh yeah. To... Um, well. Um, I, I've just arbitrarily decided that discover was the key. Um, I, I suppose I'm just saying it, it just looks up to see if the key discover exists in the cache. Correct. And then it does it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Simple as that really. Just, it's a simple string match, string comparison. Perfect. Thanks. Now it's interesting. You brought up the key though, because the example of that key is I guess we describe it as a non-parameterized or a static key, but quite often the keys could be a parameterized key. And that arises in our case because potentially our cache is going to store details about lots of different movies. You know, if we go back to the actual app itself, you know, I want to navigate to this movie and then I go back to the home page and I want to go to another movie. And I want to go back to the home page and I want to go back to one of the movies that I've already selected. Uh, and we'd like to ensure that it brings that movie from the cache on the subsequent selection. Uh, but each of these movies, we can't use a static key like movie for these. We've got to parameterize the key in some way. And an obvious example and an obvious uh, solution would be to use the movies ID as part of the key. Because as well, let's suppose we expanded out this application so that we also had pages relating to actors. And an actor has an ID. Uh, and we'd like to be able to distinguish between entries in our cache that related to a particular actor versus entries in our cache that related to a particular movie. They both have IDs, but there's no way of distinguishing between a an actor's ID and a movie's ID. We'd have to qualify it some other way. So what I'm trying to get at is um, the query key and the design of the query key can be, it's a, it's a design decision, right? In general, I'm saying the query key can be uh, something simple as a string, which we saw in the case of discover, or it could be uh, something much more complex than that. Uh, it could be an array structure, an object structure, the actual key itself now could be can be a complex structure. Uh, but as long as that complex structure is serializable, then it can be uh, it can be entered in our cache as a key value, as long as it's serializable. Going to our movies example, when we want to ask the cache, do you have a particular movie in your data store, then maybe uh, this might be my key uh, construct for for a movie. And I've just arbitrarily said, I'm going to store key as an array. Okay, it's going to be serialized at the end of the day, but it's an array. There's a static part of the array, the first entry. 
So that kind of tells me that this key, when I see it in the cache, it actually relates to a movie. And then there's the parameter or there's the dynamic part, which will be the movie's ID. So that's actually my key in this case. And we would expect then that when we, if we could look inside the cache itself, which we can, as I'll show you in a second, we'll see cache entries that actually look like this in serialized form. The query function is the same as before. In this case, it will just be getting a particular movie or making, making a different TMDB call. Uh, however, we need to, sorry, we need to somehow pass this information though to the query function. And the query function needs to extract this particular part of the key uh, because it's going to need to make the request to TMDB and it's only this part of the key that it needs in order to make the TMDB call. So how does our query function, how does it see this entire key and how can it uh, manipulate or kind of drill down into it? And that's what I'm trying to get across here. So the query function by default, it takes a single argument and that argument is bound to this data structure here. And all I'm doing in my code is I'm using destructuring. So args.query, well, sorry, slight misinformation there. Args is not bound to this here. Args is bound to an object. And one property within that object is the query key property. So args.query key, that expression is actually going to be referring to this data structure here. And all I'm doing down here is I'm just doing some uh, array destructuring. That's what I'm doing here. I'm doing array destructuring. So id part, that's going to now be a variable. And the variable is going to be referring to this little object here. And then I'm going id part and I'm extracting the ID property within that object. So ultimately now I'm going to have a variable called ID. And that variable in this particular example is going to be pointing at the integer 1234. And then I can make my HTTP request using 1234 as the movie ID. So the, the key point is when you want to have parameterized uh, parameterized keys, if you like, you need to use something other than a static string to encode your cache key. And it can be anything really. I've just decided to, to use the array structure and an object structure within that array. You might you might argue that's a little bit overcomplicating the whole thing and you wouldn't be far wrong, but you will see this style used a lot uh, if you read around the use of this library. Come back to my app. That means we need to go into the movie details page and make some changes as well. And in this case, we're going to take out this code and we're going to replace it with we're going to replace it with uh, this code here. Save it. Going to do a manual refresh. Select the first movie. That was a cache miss. Back to the home page. Select the same first movie. And there's no extra network communication going on, cache hit has occurred, back to the home page, select a different movie, and we do get the 
cash miss. So it's kind of mission accomplished. If we just again look at the code that we've substituted in, kind of explained it really because it's what I included in the screenshot. Here's the use query hook again with my key. And I'm just where ID is coming from is I'm just using the use params hook, which we saw a couple of weeks ago that extracts because if we look at the URL that's generated in the browser, you know, it includes the movie ID. Um, it includes the movie ID. So I'm just grabbing that off the that ID from the uh, the browser's address bar, and I'm using it here. You know, if I want, to, supposing I want to change this, I want to make it more sp uh, specific. If I go movie ID, then that just simply means I've got to now go into my query function and destructure, destructure this entire structure. So here's my query function. And I'm now looking for, I'm not looking for ID any longer. I'm looking for something called movie ID. Yeah. And clearly we're going to be using this uh, library in this week's version of the movies app. So you'll get a second chance to uh, play with it. What's also nice about this third party library is that it has its own developer tools extension, which allows us to see what's actually happening inside the cache itself. And the screenshot shows you that but if we look at it live, uh, this little icon here down at the bottom left, if we just click on that, that opens up the React Queries developer tools. I'll close the developer tools of the browser itself now so we have some retail space. And I'm gonna do a manual refresh. Now it's telling me there's only one entry in my cache. Here's the key of the entry. And if you click on it, it'll show you some detail on that cache entry. And down here is the actual value associated with that key. The value now is the full HTTP response. And you remember when you make the TMDB request to the discovery endpoint, You've got to drill down before you get the actual movies themselves. The movies themselves are inside here in the results object. And here are my 20 movies. If I select a particular movie, new entry has popped into my cache. That's the key. Same thing. If we click on it, we can see the actual value associated with that key. Go back to my home page. Select a different movie. Okay, so you can see the actual cache building up, which is really nice feature. Obviously, now you would not make this available to your end users. Um, and what you can also do is you can you can kind of manipulate the cache. So these buttons here allow you to. Uh, manipulated by manipulated, I mean you can force a refetching of the data, even though its TTL may not have expired. For whatever reason, you might want to do that. You can you can explicitly remove an entry from the cache. Um, I've documented them on the next slide. Okay. Um, so the refresh button forces a forces an immediate an immediate re-requesting of the data from the back end. The invalidate, we talk about the notion of data being stale in the cache. When data is stale, that means it's in need of being refetched. 
that, as we know now, is controlled by the TTL. But if for whatever reason you want to uh, preempt that TTL uh, expiring and just set the particular piece, particular entry to be stale, then you can click on the invalidate button or option over here and it sets it as being stale. What that means is that when your React code uh, requests a particular key and the React query checks that key, it does have it in its cache, but it notices that the the entry has been tagged as stale or uh, it's invalidated, it will then re-request the data from the backend. In other words, it will execute the query function. That's the way kind of it works. So even though the entry is there and it hasn't removed it from the cache yet, uh, it will still refetch it and overwrite the current entry. Uh, reset, what does reset do? Only applies when... Yeah, um, what we're conveniently ignore, uh, not encountering here now is when your React app can actually update or change the data that it has retrieved from your backend. So what happens there? That's kind of complicates it. In other words, the data is, can be mutated. Well, I guess we should update it at the backend first and then update it in the cache. Uh, but there is a... There is an issue there that you would need to be aware of, but as I said, I kind of conveniently sidestep it. The remove button removes an entry from the cache. And that's it really, uh, in terms of this one aspect of state management, which is the use of caching. And we know why caching is a good idea. And it only applies to server state data. So uh, you will get, you can play with the little app that I've given you, which is always better to play with the smaller app, smallest app that you can when you're uh, trying to learn a particular piece of technology. But we also bring it into the slightly bigger application that we're rolling out in the lab. Okay. I'm just checking my watch. So. That's all I want to cover, Witchy, in, in the React world. And so I'm now going to talk my way through the assignment specification. So uh, you know, or should know this already, uh, it's about expanding the movies app. Uh, once you've completed this week's lab, that's your starting point, And then you expand it out in various directions. And I do give you some suggestions as to changes that you can make, but you're all, always free to uh, deviate from those. Alternatively, if you want to, if you're familiar with some other web API that you'd like to use, then you may choose to develop a front end for that web API. You probably should discuss that with us though, uh, beforehand, just in case. Uh, you have over four weeks, sorry, over five weeks is uh, I think how it works out to, to work on this. So it's a reasonable amount of time, but still uh, you'd wanna get uh, engaged with it fairly, immediately i would suggest uh, so i'm setting that as the deadline date there 14th of april to 50 percent of this module what you will be submitting to me is just a github repo and you'll also be submitting a short youtube video where you demonstrate the application to me and we can talk about that uh, i'll give you some guidelines on that later on but you know it should be, probably be no more than a 10 minute video i think and i'm only interested in you demonstrating the video i won't necessarily require you to explain code or anything like that going back to the repo uh, you do need to complete the readme for that but i I will give you a fairly detailed template on how to structure the readme. 
again, I don't, it won't take you more than an hour to write up the readme and you wouldn't really do it until you finished your work anyway. So secondly, it's extremely important that you maintain a Git history throughout your work on this assignment. What I'm suggesting to you down here is that essentially every time you sit down to work on the assignment, uh, you should do a minimum of one Git commit for each session and maybe more than one commit for a session, depending on how long a session is for you. Um, for each commit, just uh, think about the commit message. So the commit message should tell me, uh, you know, what, why, what were you trying to achieve during that session? I guess it's very obvious, you know, but uh, just take a moment to think about it and state clearly what you were trying to achieve. Now, there is this uh, principle with commits that you should never commit code that isn't that is not working or that is has errors in it. You don't have to abide by that rule for this uh, assignment. It's okay to do a commit. So, for example, if you're at the end of a particular session, an hour long session or whatever that you're working on, and you didn't manage to fix whatever problem you were trying to fix or complete whatever feature you were trying to complete, you should still do the commit. Explain what you were trying to achieve, even though it's not a functioning um, piece of code. That's okay. Right. How are we going to grade it? Uh, I've come up with four grading bands, which I'm just calling the good, 40 to 50, band, the very good band, 50 to 70, the 70 to 90 band, and finally the 90 plus grading band. So let's just go through these one by one. And I guess it depends on how much time you can afford to put to this assignment as to which grading band you want to aim for. That's completely up to you. Each grading band, I've tried to come up with some sort of theme for them. So in the good grading band, I just want to ensure that you've got uh, a clear understanding of what I'm calling the foundation skills set associated with developing React app. That's what we're trying to guarantee. And let's, I'm assuming now that it's expanding the movies app. That's I've kind of documented the, the or I've described these different grading bands with that kind of assumption, admittedly, which uh, again, if you decide not to expand the movies app, then I can give you uh, an idea as to what you should be aiming for in your particular case, but you need to talk to me about that. So, so let's assuming that you're going to expand the movies app, then in the good band, you're probably developing, you're certainly developing more pages, but they have the same kind of look and feel and the same functionality as what we've already developed in the in the labs. So from a UI Kind of perspective you're going to have clearly you're going to have some new views okay three plus new views uh it's kind of arbitrary really uh, i'm saying you're going to probably have some more list views so the list views or pages that we already have is our home page that gives us a list of movies from tmdb that's the only list view that we have but in a moment or a little bit later on now i'll uh, talk a little bit about tmdb but TMDB also has information on uh, actors. So you can get a list of actors. So you might have a page that just lists actors, cards. You can get the most popular movies of all time. There's a particular TMDB endpoint that returns those. So you might have a page that displays the most popular movies of all time. You can also ask TMDB for a list of movies that are similar to a movie. Uh, and the response that you get back, you could use the same home page structure that, uh, that we've used and that template that we defined, that template component that we defined. You can use all of those components to display the list of similar movies to a movie. So I'm just uh, giving you some examples, but I would classify all of those types of pages as list views. And we already have an example of coding up a list view type component. Uh, they would also probably need to be a detail view. An example of a detail view might be an actor's bio, 
or maybe a detail on a particular TV series, because if you've looked at TMDB documentation, you'll notice that it also has endpoints related to TV series. From a routing point of view, uh, you're going to have a couple of new routes, or, uh, and at least one of them should be a parameterized route. So, for example, if you've got, if you decided that you're going to show an actor's bio page, then the URL associated with that page would be a parameterized URL where one of the parameter would be the actor's ID, I guess. But you you need to have at least one parameterized URL. The similar movies would be another example. If you've got a page that lists movies that are similar to a movie, then that page's URL would have to have the movie's ID as part of its uh, as part of its uh, URL. <laughs> so either way, uh, you'd need to have at least one parameterized URL in your list of new routes. By data hyperlinking, uh, the only example of data hyperlinking that we have so far is where we click on a card's more info. Data hyperlinks is the term that I'm using to uh, indicate hyperlinks embedded within a page as opposed to hyperlinks in the page header or page footer. So if you get an opportunity to have some data hyperlinking, you should use that. So for example, you might in your actors, supposing you had the actor's bio page, and in that page, you listed all of the movies that actor appeared in, then clearly those list of movies could be hyperlinked to bring you to the corresponding movies detail page, for example. From a data modeling point of view, I'm saying that you should be dealing with a, at least one new data entity. The only data, in, well, there are two data entities uh, that we've been using so far in the movies app that we're rolling out in the lab. There is the movies, the movie data entity, and the review data entity. Well, you need to add, add at least one more to that uh, to that um, to, uh, to that in, in entity relationship kind of uh, diagram. The obvious examples again would be actor would be a new type of entity, TV series would be a new type of entity. Uh, you should be using caching everywhere. Uh, and which is linked to what we were talking about today. In terms of new functionality, because everything so far is, uh, okay, these are new pages, but th they're not terribly exciting. Uh, routing is technical, data model is kind of from a technical point of view. In terms of functionality, uh, maybe I'm suggesting you could have some additional filtering and sorting options in that filtering card that we have, you know, where we click on the filter uh, action button and it displays our filtering card on the left. At the moment, we can only filter on the base of genre and movie title, but maybe you could add some more criteria that would allow the user to filter whatever list of movies they're currently looking at. And it's up to you to decide what other filtering criteria. The other filtering criteria would be determined by what other properties are associated with a movie that you might want to filter on. Sorting is self-explanatory. Uh, the My Fantasy Movie feature, I'm taking, I've broken this up into two parts now. I'm saying that there's a basic My Fantasy Movie feature, which would really translate into having a web form that allows you to enter some properties for your Maria fantasy movie. And I'm stating down here um, that we're only interested in, a, let's say, in certain properties that you're allowing the user to enter. So you're allowing the user to specify, uh, where am I detailing, the title of the movie, an overview of it, list of genres, so that that's probably going to be a drop-down menu where the user can select multiple entries in the drop-down menu. A release date for the movie, Maria. It would be nice if you had a date picker component 
And if you do a quick Google search on React Date Picker, then you'll get lots of third-party components that would implement that for you, rather than entering the date as some sort of string, which can be error-prone. Runtime, numeric, uh, production company, uh, that probably should be a drop-down menu as well, because there is a TeamDB endpoint that gives you the list of production companies uh, that it has on record. So presumably you should select one of those. So it's a simple web form really is all I'm asking you to develop here. And the context for the web form is, let's say isn't you're uh, recording your fancy movie. Now, where are you storing that? Well, you're you're going to have to store it for now. And you will be storing it in a context, I guess, a context construct. Once you've done some backend development, which you will start with, with Frank from next week on, then you could be storing that fantasy movie in a database supported by your own custom backend. So all of that, if you could achieve all of that, then you're guaranteed to get it within the 40 to 50 grade band. I'm just going to pause for a second in case there's anything you want to ask me about this grade band before I move on. It's all fairly straightforward, I think you agree. Moving up to the next one. What I'm trying to uh, ascertain as to whether you can actually adapt the use of the React framework to do other things that we haven't done so far in the lab. In other, in other words, to develop features within the React app that are new in terms of their uh, their structure, their component structure, in terms of their UI component uh, structure uh, and the UI style, etc. You don't have to go overboard on the styling side of it because I have done very little on styling, to be honest, but it's more functionality that I'm trying to get at here rather than uh, UI styling. So, uh, and also, you know, you, you're you're comfortable experimenting with the framework and experimenting with JavaScript as well, I guess. Trying to break that down into a little bit more detail for you in terms of the UI, uh, you would have what I'm calling extensive data, data hyperlinking, because now presumably, you know, you're going to have, let's say five, six, seven new types of pages. And at the end of the day, they're all related to movies, actors, actors, movies. So there should be Anywhere you see a movie title appearing in a page it should be hyperlinked to bring you to that movie's detail page. Anywhere you see an actor's name, it should be hyperlinked uh, and so on and so forth. So every, look for every opportunity to use data hyperlinking. Pagination. Uh, now it turns out if we just go back to, let's say, we can actually look at it here. Uh, if I go into my API code and I'm just interested in the structure of the URL that we sent to TMDB. So let me just try and break it down now. You've got the, what's called the query string part. So you've got the domain name, you've got the endpoint within that domain, and then you've got what's called the query string, which is everything that appears after the question mark, which you're familiar with from uh, your studies on HTTP. And the query string is made up of key value pairs. So one of the keys in my query string is that, and the value is whatever I'm assigning to it. The next key is this one. The next key is that one. So the and is concatenating all the keys. And it's the very last key that I'm interested in, which is this one here. So it turns out that the, and this is related specifically to the discover endpoint now. This, the discover endpoint is paginated. Now we have, up to now, always been asking for the first page 
uh, of movies from the Discover endpoint. But in fact, this page attribute can uh, have any value from, I think it's one to 200. So there are lots and lots of other movies that we don't see at all in our homepage at the moment in our, in our movies app that we're developing in the labs because we've hard coded it to page one. But it would be nice if our homepage had that kind of standard pagination uh, hyperlinking at the bottom of the page so that we could click on other pages and subsequently make other requests to TMDB for the other pages of movies that it has in its data store. So uh, that's an example of something that you might try and tackle for this grade band. And indeed, any of the other, uh, what I might call listing views. So uh, well, we only have one really at the moment, which is the home page. But if you were getting a, uh, did you do the upcoming movies? I think you did the upcoming movies actually page in last week's lab. That's also a paginated endpoint. Um, if you wanted to get a list of actors, that's also paginated. So pagination is supported in lots of other parts of the TMDB uh, API. But you would start with the homepage and try and implement pagination there. Now, I've got some other stuff to talk to you about in relation to pagination a little bit later on, but we'll just move on for now. Uh, from a routing point of view, I'm saying have basic authentication. By that, I mean take the authentication and protected routes uh, solution that I provided or that I discussed with you last week. Essentially, take that solution and lift it and drop it into your movies app so that you have what I'm calling basic authentication supported. And therefore, that would allow you to have private and protected, public and private routes. So for example, maybe the movie's detail page could be a protected route. You have to authenticate before you can see uh, a movie's uh, detail page. Also, we could use authentication to control access to particular pieces of functionality. You know, let's supposing the user cannot do filtering of the movies unless they've authenticated. So filtering is notionally some sort of premium feature that I have in my application, Maria. Another obvious example would be the user cannot select favorites unless they have authenticated first. So that, that's at the functionality level uh, rather than at the page level. We already know how to do it at this level. It doesn't take a whole lot extra to achieve uh, protection of particular features. Functionality-wise, um, well, if you are pursuing the actor side of things and you're displaying, uh, let's say you're displaying uh, a list of actors or you're displaying all of the actors in a particular movie, um, then I guess a simple thing might be to implement a favorite actors feature, which would be very similar to the favorite movies, obviously. So you could uh, reuse a lot of that uh, idea, but at the in relation to actors, or if you're more interested in TV series, similarly, you could have a selecting of your favorite TV series from a list of series. Multi-criteria search. Now, that brings me, uh, I, I'll come back to that in a while because I need to look at the detail of TMDB, but the idea here is to have a web form with lots of uh, user controls on that form, which the user would select and enter and then click submit. And the effect of the submit is you're sending a request to TMDB for movies with particular characteristics. The characteristics might relate to, uh, did a particular actor, I'm only interested in movies that a particular actor appeared in, 
I'm only interested in movies that were produced by a particular production company. Uh, I'm only interested in movies for a particular genre or set of genres uh, or a combination of all of those. So that's what we mean by multi-criteria search. Now, you could spend a lot of time, you could have lots and lots of criteria, but you could limit it to maybe four or maximum of five criteria. And it's up to you to decide what criteria to pick. But I do need to come back to this idea in a second to show you how you would actually do that with TMDB because it is built into uh, TMDB already. The, 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 the option to request, be it movies or actors, but let's stick with movies, the ability to request movies with certain criteria uh, is already available to us. Uh, in other words, if I actually just look here, for example, it's how you, it's really with these keys, you can specify the various criteria. That's essentially what we're doing here. What I'm saying is I only want movies from the discovery endpoint that are uh, where US English is the main language of the movie. And to keep it clean here, I'm saying I'm only interested in movies that are not categorized as adult movies. But if we look up the documentation on TMDB, so these are two criteria, but if we look up the documentation on TMDB, we'll see that it has, I think I checked it there yesterday, it has 32 different criteria that you can specify in the query string, all of which allows you to narrow down the particular uh, movies that you want to have included in the response that's sent back by TMDB. So you have a web form which allows the user to enter the criteria. Then when the user submits that web form, what you would need to do programmatically is essentially construct this query string and then tag on that constructed query string on to you know the end of the on to the end of this uh, URL. So there's a bit of from a JavaScript point of view. There's a little bit of work there in, in doing the construction of the string. I'll come back to that, but that's what I mean by multi-criteria search. I'm always open to other suggestions from you, but if you if you manage to get both of these working, then I'd be happy with that. Now, invariably, if you're in this grade band you're probably going to be developing some new components apart from page components. Now you're going to be developing some new components. And so you should have some storybook support for those components. You know, in the previous grade band, you may well get away without having to write any new low level components yourself. So you don't need any additional storybook support in that case. Moving on to the 70 to 90 grade band. Um, if we just fast forward to here from a functionality point of view, again, these are just suggestions that I'm coming up with. It would be nice. We know how to select our favorite movies and they get added uh, to our favorite movies page and they're stored in our context. But we've no way of ordering those favorites. So, you know, we might have our number one favorite movie or number two, et cetera, et cetera. So if there was some way to allow the user, once they had selected a movie as being their favorite and it gets added to the list, to maybe subsequently, either immediately or, or at some later stage, allow them to shuffle the list of favorite movies into the order that they would like. Um, if I just bring up the app itself for a second. And close off all of this.
So I'm going to select some favorites. Now, one thing you might do is, you know, you could have a left arrow, right arrow on each of these cards. And if I click my left arrow, that moves this card to here. In other words, it's, it shuffles it up. And so I could play around with those arrows to order these in the way that I want them to be ordered. My favorite, second favorite, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to store them that way in the uh, in your context as well. Remember, we're storing them in an array, so you'd have to shuffle the array in the context as well, but that's straightforward enough. So that's one way of doing it, of implementing the ordering of your favorites. Or you might have uh, some sort of an icon here. When I click on that icon, it opens up a little text box and I can enter uh, the position of that I want this movie to move to. So I enter one here and hit return. And now this card shuffles over here. And this becomes number two, this is number three, and this is number four. That would be another way of allowing the user to uh, order their favorites. Or you could come up with some other way that looks nice from a UI perspective. But any one of those two approaches from a UI perspective would, would be nice. That's what I mean by ordering of favorites. Similarly, if you had actors, favorite actors, same kind of idea, but just do it for one context uh, would be sufficient. There's no need to repeat it. Ordered favorites. Uh, creating themed playlists. Uh, if I, I'd like to be able to create my own movie playlist and for each playlist, it would have a title. You can just come up with whatever you want to just be a piece of text. The theme for that playlist, again, that's just text. And then the list of movies uh, that you have added to that playlist. And presumably it would be nice if you could remove movies from a playlist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the ability to create a playlist initially, I guess, add some entries to it, and then maybe add other entries later on, remove entries from the playlist. But you have multiple playlists uh, options. At the moment, we, I suppose you could say that the favorites is a type of a playlist, but not really. We like the to give the user more control in terms of what title they want to associate with the playlist, the theme that they want to associate with it. And it's up, you know, the theme is just a piece of text, right? You know, fantasy movies or uh, science fiction movies, whatever, science fiction movies before 1980, whatever. You can come up with any theme that you want to. It doesn't really matter. It's the ability to create them, add movies to them, remove movies from the playlist. So that, that would take a bit of work really to try and get something working. It doesn't have to be, from a user experience point of view, it doesn't have to be squeaky clean. It's, it's more just the functionality of getting it uh, working would be more important from, from my perspective. Going back to the fantasy movie, I'm saying now if we'd li I'd like a more advanced version of this fantasy movie idea, and by advanced, I mean the ability, and I ex explain it down here, the ability to add actors and roles to your movie. So initially we are in our basic form of this fantasy movie, we have a simple web form with just some text fields and drop down menus. Where had I it? Um, back here. We just had a simple web form with some text fields, drop down menus, check boxes, whatever was appropriate. But now in addition to that, have the ability to add a role to the movie, the name of the role or the character's name, and then be able to select an existing actor from the list of actors that TMDB provides and associate that actor with that role. Um, how might that look? Let's see. So let's supposing I have, if I go to the movie's detail page, 
So let's suppose in this now is, is showing my my fantasy movie. We won't have images. We don't have to have all of this stuff. We do have a title. We have an overview. Well, we might have genres, all right. But maybe there's some button here that says add a role. And when I click on that, it, it can either open up some sort of a web form here or go to a new page. And on that web form, I'd enter my the name of this particular character. Um, and maybe there's an add actor button here. When I click on that, I go to a page that just lists uh, actor cards. So it lists actors a bit like this. So instead of movie cards, I have actor cards. And I can somehow click on a card and that associates that actor with that role in my fantasy movie. And I can do that a number of times. That might be one way it would work. From a user experience point of view, it's, it would be okay. Or you might come up with a slightly smoother implementation of it. Again, I'm not too fussed about the user experience as long as it's reasonable. What we don't want is in my fantasy movie page, let's supposing this is my fantasy movie page. What I don't want is a simple drop down menu of all of the actors in TMDB and select one of them. That wouldn't be great. Something slightly better than that. So that's the advanced fantasy movie or some variation on it. Uh, from a routing point of view, I am looking for you to bring in a more robust authentication implementation using a third party uh, authentication library. And in particular, I'm mentioning Superbase. Superbase is very similar to Firebase. A lot of you may have come across Firebase already. I don't want people using Firebase though. Um, I'm specifically requesting you to use Superbase. It's very similar to Firebase in terms of how you use it to implement your React Apps authentication functionality. So if you click on that link, it'll bring you to the Superbase uh, homepage. And so you'd obviously have to read up a little bit on how you can use Superbase authentication with React. Lots and lots of articles out there on that. Superbase also provides a backend persistence uh, feature, just like Firebase does. I think it's called Firestore. Again, if you're familiar with Firebase, you probably would have heard of Firestore. Superbase has a similar feature. I don't, I'm not sure what it calls it exactly, but it has a persistence feature as well as authentication. Because the theme for theme for this grade band is independent learning. And that's where the independent learning mainly comes in. You'd have to just read up on the use of Superbase. And finally, uh, and this is not as daunting as it might sound, deployment, deploying your React app to a cloud provider service. I'm suggesting Vercel is one. This is actually quite easy to do. Uh, so th this is the least demanding part of this grade band to get deployment working. You can go to the Vercel site and find out how to deploy your React app to Vercel. Or if, you, if you've if you used um, Netlify, that would do as well. Any, any deployment platform, I don't really care which one you use. Um, and then the outstanding, it really, in this grade band, I'm saying you, you could bring in backend persistence. In other words, you use the super base persistence feature to, for example, store your fantasy movie, store your list of favorites, that idea. And also maybe the whole user experience of your the various features that you have developed 
are quite impressive, maybe from a mature UI perspective, but getting that would be sufficient. Now, you know, some of you might decide, look, I'm only going to aim for, let's say, I'm only going to aim for this grade band here. Well, you can still, if you want to, do, for example, do the deployment, and you will get marks for that. So you'll get marks essentially for everything that you that you document in the README and show in your in your video YouTube video recording of the demonstration. But I've also uh, in this assignment specification, I have a link to a second page which talks a little bit about TMDB. I think the starting point for this assignment is to spend about an hour or so poking around the TMDB docs to see what are the various endpoints that are available to me that I can use. So far in the labs, we've used the discovery endpoint. We've used the movie details endpoint. We've used the movie reviews endpoint, and we've used the genres endpoint, four of them that I can recall off the top of my head. Uh, there are lots and lots more of them. And if we click on this link here, brings us to the docs. And if we scroll down to this part of the docs down here, this is where you get all the information on the various endpoints that are available to you. And so if we pick the discovery one, which is the one that we've been using, click on it, shows you how to use that endpoint, which we're already familiar with. You can make a get request to this endpoint and it shows you uh, the structure of the response, it shows you how you need to authenticate, which is essentially using your API key. It shows you what options are available to you in terms of the query string. That becomes very important in relation to our multi-criteria search, which I will come back to in a second. But uh, And it also shows you, tells you about the, tells you about the response structure as well. So there are various other, and so you need to just, uh, as I said, poke around the different endpoints just to see what's available to you before you decide what you're going to develop. Uh, going back to discovery endpoints, uh, and this is a point I was making a while ago. I'm saying that there are lots of query string options available to you when you're using the discovery endpoint, for example. And I showed you in the code there uh, a while back that the query string is that part of the URL that appears after the question mark in the query string. And the query string from a structural point of view is a set of key value pairs. And again, I'm showing you that here. Now, if we do look at the discovery endpoint, so let's go back to TMDB, which I have just looked at there a moment ago. And if I scroll down, to the query string part. And here it's telling me all of the different keys that I can use in my query string. So I can specify the language that I'm interested in, which is one of the keys that I've been using so far. I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously. Uh, just pick up maybe some interesting ones. You can actually get it to sort the array of movies that it returns back to you. That may or may not be useful. Uh, you can specify the uh, the certifying country. Not too interesting. Let's see. And you see here, there are 32 different query string options available to us. And that's really what will facilitate this multi-criteria search that I'm talking about. And you can look down through them yourselves. I just try and pick out one or two vaguely interesting ones. We're only interested in movies that have a cert that has a certification of less than or equal to a particular certification category. There is another endpoint that tells you what are the different certification categories that TMDB supports. 
and see include that we had already include video is uh, not so much multi-criteria search now but you can get tmdb to return trailer videos so you could have that as actually a feature i didn't mention that anywhere in my specification but the ability to watch a movies trailer videos uh, built embedded within one of your i guess the movie detail page would be a appropriate place to put that the page property we've talked about at length let's see if there's any other interesting ones uh, movies that were released after a particular release date you can specify dates are always tricky things to work with i'm not sure if i'd go for that one though but uh let's see year would be straightforward enough we're only interested in movies that uh were that is associated with a particular year i guess i'm not sure if that's release date but it wouldn't really matter we also know that tmdb has uh has popularity kind of stats associated with each movies so these two here vote count and vote average you know maybe you're only interested in movies that were voted by a certain number of people and that have an overall voting average of a certain value or greater than or equal to a certain value with cast is a quite an interesting one you're only here you would specify if you look across you you assign actor ids uh in a in a string a comma separated string and you specify that string as your with cast query key and so it will only return movies uh that that particular or any one of the actors actually appeared in so you're only interested in those movies so that's a fairly detailed search that tmdb does on the server side so you'd have to construct the string with your actor ids which you've gotten previously somehow from tmdb construct your string and then assign that string to this property here send out your request and you get back only those movies that had those actors in them and so on and you can look at look through some of the rest of the 32 options as i said pick maybe five would be uh, more than enough in your multi-criteria search that's the discovering point so it, it's a it's a lot more powerful than what we have been using it for up to now as well as being a paginated endpoint uh, the movie's endpoint we've used that already uh, it has both what i'm calling parameterized and static options so the movie's endpoint let's just quickly find it on tmdb's documentation So there's lots of options here actually so get movie details that's the one we've been using so far um see get credits is where you're going to get a list of all of the actors in that movie in fact what you get is what it calls the cast and crew so you get all of the actors in the movie and all of the production team now we're not in which it calls the crew we're not interested in the uh, production side of it we're only interested in the actors so if you how do we how do we use that endpoint we click on it so it's get slash movies a particular movie id slash credits and you get back a data structure now make sure you examine the structure that's sent back to you because you will need to drill down into it to get the list of to get the actor's information and i think it just gives you the actor's id maybe some brief details on them but then you can use that actor's id 
to get a bigger profile of the actor if you have an actor's detail page, for example. As well in the movie's endpoint, there are things like, I uh, see here, get similar movies, um, get reviews, which we've looked at already, or we've used already, get similar movies, does what you think it does, uh, and some others as well that are kind of useful. So some of these endpoints are parameterized. Then if we scroll right down to the end, there are also these kind of non-parameterized or static ones. So this one here returns the most popular movies of all time. You can see the URL is not, param uh, is not parameterized in this case. Again, this is actually a paginated response as well. So it gives you, initially it gives you the top 20 most popular movies, but if you want movies from 21 up to 40, you move on to page two, et cetera, et cetera. That's the movies endpoint. Lots of options there available to us. Um, the people's endpoint is where we get details on actors and uh, production people. Again, there are parameterized and static variations within that. So if you want to get a, a person's full bio, or you can get a list of the movies that an actor has appeared in, or a list of the TV series that an actor has appeared on. And quickly find those on TMDB. There's people. So here, get movie credits is where you get a list of all of the movies that a particular actor uh, has appeared in, provided you know their ID. And on and on it goes. Uh, trending endpoints, trending movies, trending actors, certification endpoints. That's you know, you know that can be useful, but it, there's probably only one part to it where it just returns the different certification uh, categories that TMDB uses. Uh, companies would be production companies, TV series, lots of stuff available there, TV series uh, episodes, and on and on it goes. So as I said, spend about an hour minimum, I would say, poking around, just seeing what's available to you. Now, if I go back to one thing that I missed actually earlier on, and it relates to pagination. So if I go back to the specification and where I mentioned pagination, uh, here and I have a note on pagination down here. Now, okay, we know that TMDB supports pagination, but the React Query library uh, supports pagination as well. Um, there's a couple of aspects to this now. If I go to here, let's say, have I lost my... Yeah, let's just, um, sorry now, if I bring in my caching app again. I hope now the caching is still there. I didn't remove it. Did I remove it? Okay, let's hope. All right, I'm just gonna close off some stuff here first.
And if I can't fix this quickly, then cannot read property of undefined. Good old standard error. I wonder what did I do? Let's just do it this way. Oh yeah, <laughs> let's just undo all of that. Right. Now the key that I chose for um for the list of movies was this one right but i've now told you that the discovery endpoint is paginated and so if i had pagination available to me here so i might have your you know your classic kind of pagination links down here one two three four and i could click on them and it would bring me a different set of movies but if i'm going to be caching all of that then this key here now is no longer sufficient I'd need to include the page number in the key as well, because if I'm looking at page one and I click on page two, bring me those two movies. If I then go back to page one, I don't want my app re-requesting the list of movie, uh, movies associated with page one, i.e. I, I want my cache to store them for me. But this key now is no longer sufficient to uh, support pagination. So I'd need to include the page number as well in this key. Uh, turns out though that the React Query library uh, is aware of that aspect of caching. The idea that you know apps may have a pagination aspect to the server state data that they're storing. And so if I go back to my assignment specification, I mentioned this here that the React query does actually uh, guide you as to how you should include pagination in your caching support. And if you click in the hyperlink, it brings you straight to the React query documentation and to a particular page within the documentation. And so you would need to have a maybe a bit of a read of that that particular page maybe do some further Googling as well, but the answer is in here really as to how you could uh, include pagination in your caching keys. This is the full uh, query cache documentation. And if you go back to here, turns out uh, this is the new name now for the React Query uh, caching library, the TAN stack. There's, there's actually a number of aspects to it. But I, you don't necessarily need to go looking at other parts of the React Query library. What you will have, what I showed you today, and what you will use in this week's lab covers most of the ground. The only thing it doesn't cover is building in pagination into your query keys. And this particular page brings you straight to that part uh, of the documentation. So you need to have maybe a, a read of that uh, as as well so th this shows you this page will explain how you build it into your caching support but in terms of the ui side of it you know where i was talking about i'm, I'm going to have my standard pagination hyperlinks down here in my UI, my one, two, three, four, and my forward and back arrows, there are third party React components that you can get that implement the UI part of pagination. So just do a Google query on React pagination UI and you, you get lots of third party components as usual. The ones at the top of the list are probably the best ones to pick, but you don't have to grow your own 
pagination UI, you can just use a third party component. And using third party components in general is encouraged. We don't discourage that. Right, I don't know how useful that uh, tour through the specification was for you. So as usual, go away and read the specification and if you've got any immediate questions, feel free to ask me them on Slack. And as usual, it's not until you get stuck into developing stuff that more questions might arise, not so much debugging related questions, but how you might approach a particular implementation. Am I looking for this or am I looking for that? And I can give you answers to those questions. Uh, but usually, you know, whatever approach you decide is probably the approach that I would use as well. Okay. Uh, okay, that's good timing on my part. Uh, that's where we're going to leave it for today. Frank is going to be with you next week. Sorry, now just one second. Yeah, that's it. Um, I leave it at that. Have a look at the, go to the lab first. Uh, don't dive into the assignment uh, immediately. Spend about an hour, as I said, poking around the documentation, the TeamDB documentation, think about what you want to develop and then uh, get involved in the assignment. It, there are five plus weeks, but as I said, they can go fairly quickly, especially if you start hitting kind of debugging related issues. Okay, I'll talk to you on Thursday via Slack, unless you've got any questions. Oh, thanks very much. Great, thanks a lot, bye-bye now. Bye-bye.